Good afternoon, my name is Eduardo. I'm one of the fellows here at Stanford. The purpose of me being here is to somehow replace Dr. Blevins who could not make it to the meeting. And so I'll be giving a little bit of an overview of what I've been doing with him as well as with Tony Ritchie in the last year. The title of the talk is Grin Microendoscopy of the Inner Ear. I have no disclosures. So as everyone here in the room knows, hearing loss is the most prevalent of all human disorders. It is estimated that there are 640 million people worldwide with some type of handicapped hearing loss. In over 80% of the cases, it's due to damage or injury to the sensory hair cells or their associated spiral ganglion neurons. Developing effective means of preventing these disorders and of treating them when they do occur is, of paramount, is a paramount challenge. Now, it's been said that we lag behind the neuroscience as well as the ophthalmology world in terms of the research. And I do agree. And the reason I think it's because they have access to tissue that they can easily study. They can easily see and peek into the retina. You can open up the skull and have enough tissue to, unfortunately, the cochlea is embedded deep within the temporal bone. It's surrounded by the hardest bone in the body and breaking it results usually with damage to the inner ear structures. Thus, conventional methods that we've been using, such as immunofluorescent, confocal, two-photon, and electrophysiology preparations require direct access to the inner ear, basically with in vitro preparations. And if you really think of all the conferences, all the talks given today, there's a common denominator. They all are harvesting this tissue and using it in in vitro preparations. We're cutting out the tissue, we're putting it in petri dishes, and we're studying it, we're imaging it. But none of them has been actually shown in terms of in a dynamic in vivo environment or preparation. Thus, all the established methods so far could study cochlear morphology or function, but not both. That's why we've relied on indirect tests, such as ABRs, auditory brain responses, or otoacoustic emissions, to kind of assess the status of the inner ear. So one of the big limitations of this is we're, we're, we're not capable of studying all the cellular pathways and degeneration that occurs in the inner ear. And so I want to talk to you about GRIN microendoscopy. This type of imaging modality is very recent to the inner ear field, and it provides micron scale, which is very key. It's micron scale optical resolution in tissues that otherwise have been inaccessible to light microscopy in an in vivo model. GRIN stands for graded refractive index lenses. You can see here in a GRIN lens beside a 20x objective as well as beside one a penny. These lenses are customizable. You can order them how long or how wide you want them depending on your experiment. And instead of having light come through the barrel of an objective and at the end being deflected toward your target tissue, what it does is that it forms a sinusoidal pathway, as you can see on the right. That allows us to insert it deep into the tissue that you want to study. And thus, the primary function of the relay is to provide sufficient length for insertion into deep tissue. So, just to give you an introduction of where I'm heading with this, wouldn't it be nice to put one of these lenses just close to the organ of Cordy, where you can see a beautifully highly organized tonotopic organ of Cordy and see as it functions in real time in an in vivo dynamic manner and somehow induce some damage either by furosemide, ethacrinic acid, or noise induced, and see how it partially is damaged, and then continue following this process into 
once the organ of Cordy becomes a flat sensory epithelium. In the similar fashion, wouldn't it be nice to test compounds that we could actually look at microns? So if we look at the organ of Cordy and we flip the animal over and we insert a grin lens, we can try to see how this experiment is gonna work. Now, I am using the guinea pig just because it has a big bulla, it's easy to access, and the cochlea is relatively large. It has four and a half turns. So this is one of the guinea pigs that is in a heating pad. We do a postauricular incision, an incision behind the ear, and then we go down all the way until we hit bone. That bone that we hit is the bulla. We make a entrance there, as you can see with a probe, and then once we clear the bulla, we can see the basal turn of the cochlea as well as the round window and the round window niche. And so this is a small uh, video with a couple seconds showing a, a chemical cochleostomy that we're doing. It's phosphoric acid. And Jennifer Alyona, who's been working with me, is presenting a poster. Hopefully you got to review it. You can go back and see it. And she has all the information regarding this cochleostomy. And so this is what we're left. We're left with the opening at the scale of tympani at the basal turn of the cochlea. This is the second stage of the, surgery, of, the, of the experiment where you're seeing a capillary, it's a video, a few seconds long, showing a capillary filled with AM143, which is a dye that we inject into the scala tympani that enters the scala media and enters the, the hair cell through the mechanotransduction channel. And this allows us to visualize hair cells. We did measurements of uh, our guinea pigs in relation to our chemical cochleostomy. And for a couple animals, we noticed that baseline compared to after opening, there was minimal damage to the hearing. And then testing hearing for the AM143 injection, injection, this is baseline, this is after AM143 injection, and this is a, the summary, showing not much threshold difference. So AM143, I injected it, I harvested the cochlea, opened it up and looked under a dissecting scope just to see what we would find. And as you can see, the organ of Cordy is labeled. There's a lot of green as well all around, but you can start seeing the three rows of outer hair cells as well as the inner row of hair cells. Now, in terms of preliminary data, I ran an experiment where this is a live animal where I injected AM143 into the round window. I used a one millimeter Grin microendoscope and I placed it through the scala tympani. The grin lens was coupled to a 20x objective that had a 0.5 numerical aperture, and this was coupled to a two photon, and this is what we would see. You can kinda imagine that there's three rows of outer hair cells and a row of inner hair cells. This took approximately 67 guinea pigs, and it was really a shot in the dark. And so this is where the beauty of Stanford and cross-discipline feedback is that I was thinking how better I can get these results or have a higher yield of results. And it turns out that we use endoscopes in ear surgery, you use endoscopes in the nose to get to cavities inside the brain that is not easily reachable. And I want to acknowledge Dr. Huang and Dr. Nayak for allowing me to use the research tools that they have. Now, what you see here is the rig where I'm working. On the bottom part, you will see the animal which is wrapped in a blue towel and Velcroed down to a stereotactic head holder. The stereotactic head holder moves in all dimensions and is motorized. You can see the rigid endoscope on the left, and you can see the grin lens just at the tip of that. And I'm gonna show you another photo just as we place the grin lens, you can see now on the monitor on the superior aspect, you can see a small hole, and now we can clearly visualize the cochleostomy. And if we focus in a little bit more, we can see that if we place the rigid nasal endoscope close by, we can see where the placement of this grin lens uh, is. 
this was a huge undertaking because if you think about it, as the Greenlands is coming down, it's very dark and we would, it would be a shot in the dark. So now we have direct visualization. And so I have a video here so you can see. And that's why I have the windows down. Let's see if. So if you look here, this is our grin lens. This is the opening right here, the bulla opening. And if you focus right here, that's our cochleostomy at the scala tympani in the basal turn of the cochlea. And before this was being done just by pure calculation from the outside. And now we're able, you can see I'm moving the guinea pig in that stereotactic head holder. And we're, the grin lens is not moving, it's all the animal, and we can direct the grin lens into the cochleostomy to the area where we want to image. And so, at this stage, we're developing the technology to try to get this reliably. And so we started trying this out in hair cells, but we said, why don't we just step back a little bit and try to see before entering into and visualizing the hair cells, let's see if we can see some blood vessel flow on the lateral aspect of the cochlea. And this is a video that we captured on a live guinea pig that we placed a catheter in the femoral vein. And hopefully you can see, but we can now with the resolution that we have, we can see individual red blood cells. This is real time in a live guinea pig. And we're able to record from the system. And so what are the potential applications that we could use this? Well, we can identify early intervention sites for preventing, reducing, or reversing ototoxicity in a dynamic in vivo way. So for example, similar to the slide I showed you before, you have an organ of cordy. What happens when it's partially injured, when it's the flat center of epithelia, and what we can do to reconstitute the organ of cordy? In a similar fashion, we can start thinking about what is the entry pathway and time course of different types of medications. The classical being aminoglycosides. Is it through the apical? Do, does does the, the aminoglycosides enter through the stria vascularis, through the apical part of the, of the hair cell, or does it enter the basal lateral? We still don't know, and this technology could allow it. What is the time course of cellular dysfunction following aminoglycoside or noise-induced damage? Is there a way that we can describe a roadmap of cellular changes? So the future directions. Establishment of this technology has the potential to revolutionize inner ear research at the basic, translational, and even clinical level. Grin microendoscopy at the cochlea will be used to monitor inner ear treatment interventions such, such as drug or gene-induced regeneration, viral transfection, which is in the immediate future, of remaining supporting cells or stem cell transplantation studies where individual cells can be visualized. Complete hearing preservation would establish in vivo cochlear microendoscopy as a potential intervention in human otologic disease. For example, we routinely see patients with Meniere's disease, and we tell them, well, you know, it's endolymphatic high drops, it could be viral, it could be inflammatory. We really don't know what is going on with these patients. Oh. I skipped one here. Likewise, if we develop fluorescent imaging techniques, coupled to the Grin optical technology. As it gets smaller and smaller, we can integrate these two technologies to better visualize the inner ear. Ideally, we would be using the mouse animal model just because it's, it's been developed in terms of transgenic models. And so we could apply that, the fluorescent technique, as well as the miniaturization of the Grin technology. I really want to thank uh, Tony as well as Dr. Blemens for the, all the insight as well as the mentoring. And I want to thank Dr. Jackler for always the support of the research. I'll take any questions.
The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.